Well, a pleasant hello to you wherever you happen to be. I am your host, Michael Hingson, and you are listening to Unstoppable Mindset. We're really glad you're with us. And today we get to talk to Denise Meredith, who has a really interesting story, um, a few factoids, and then we will just go from there. She, as a child, wanted to be a veterinarian, but had some sexist issues and they wouldn't let her do it. I want to know about that. Um, I think the world has changed in that regard some, but nevertheless, when she was wanting to do it, it was different. She's the first female professional hired by the Bureau of Land Management, and um, that's fascinating. And she's got a lot of other things to uh, to talk about. So I don't think we're going to have any problem filling up an hour, Denise. So I want to welcome you to yeah. Unstoppable Mindset, and thanks for being here. Well, well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate being invited. I'm looking forward to it. Well, why don't we start then with you talking a little bit about the uh, the early Denise, the child and all that, you, you know, what where you grew up and some of that kind of stuff and what made you interested in being a veterinarian and, you know, we can take it from there. Sure. Um, well, I am born in Brooklyn, like so many people. In New York City, a lot of people born in Brooklyn and then they migrate to different boroughs. And, and where the are the best bagels in Brooklyn? Well, well, I didn't stay there long enough to find them. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My parents I was, moved to Queens. <laughs> oh, then, well, okay. Where are the best bagels in Queens? Queens. Queens. Uh, we had so many. See, yeah. and this is what I tell people who grew up in New York City, every block will have a good bagel shop. Yeah, I know. That's why I asked the question, <laughs> trying to be cute. It's uh, it's like but, I lived in Chicago for five years. I was born in Chicago, moved out when I was five. And so I don't know when things like Garrett Popcorn started, but I know that whenever I go <laughs> through Chicago, I, I do need to go to Garrett Popcorn and O'Hare or... If I'm in the city, then I'll go to one of the places downtown. We do we do tend to do some of the things in the world by our food. What can I say? Yes, or the best hot dogs. Yeah, so that would be asking you where to get the best hot dog in Chicago. Sure. <laughs> and then there is Chicago pizza, which is different than New York pizza, but that's okay, too. Yeah, they're both good. Ah, what a world. <laughs> anyway. So, so, yeah, so I uh, sort of grew up in, not sort of, I did grow up in Queens, and I had what I call a Norman Rockwell childhood, if you've seen his paintings and pictures, that's pretty much my childhood, box, uh, soapbox derbies, free houses, uh, that type of thing. My dad had grown up on a ranch in Texas, so that's why he moved to Queens. He wanted more land <laughs> around his house there. And so we had a big lot, and our house became the center of attention in the neighborhood. Mm. We had bar the barbecues, parties, we had a a finished basement with a pool table and ping pong table and all that stuff. So we were at the center of things. My dad was a Renaissance man. He, um, <laughs> believe it or not, I didn't ride horses when he grew up. He thought horses would work. He couldn't understand why people rode horses for fun <laughs> once he became an adult. So uh, instead, he, uh, he was a musician, um, big bands. He played in big bands. Oh, what did he, he play? Uh, um, any horn, okay. literally. And also the drums and also the guitar. <laughs> Anything he could get his hands on. And, uh, he was an army, an army veteran, so he played an army band as well. He was an uh, amateur tennis player, a poet, a professional photographer, you name it, he did it. And then my mom was a community organizer. So um, church, uh, PTA, anything that <laughs> needed somebody in charge, she was it. So when you merge those two together, you get me. <laughs> so... I uh, liked a lot of different things. My mom, she belonged to the Animal Association there, you know, Humane Society. So um, I had all kinds of pets growing up. Mm. So it was logical that I would want to be a vet because there's not too many professions in New York. You could be a go to Broadway, and I did take dance lessons most of my life. Uh, <laughs> but you could go to Broadway, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer or a vet. That was pretty much it. So, <laughs> so I picked the vet because Cornell – was in New York, one yeah. of the you know, top vet schools in the world. Yes. But when I got up there, I found out <laughs> that they weren't too keen on women being vets. They were just letting like one woman a year into the vet school. And pretty much to be that woman, I knew it was going to be me because there would be somebody who pretty much grew up on a farm or something or whose parent was a, preferably who went to Cornell. <laughs> what, so, was, what was their logic? I mean, and of course, I'm looking at it from today's – uh, standpoint 
and today's point of view. But what was their uh, what was their, their logic? logic? Physical, physical. The women uh, weren't capable of being vets. Uh, even the women, the few that I let in there, you had to be a small uh, animal vet. Couldn't, uh, be, couldn't be work with horses or anything like that. So, which I thought was pretty ironic. Can you yeah. think of all the women? cowgirls and stuff yeah <laughs> why <laughs> why they would think women in fact why i went to cornell i had a lot of offers when i went to cornell was because i had the best equine country uh program in the country and i do like horses so anyway i got to do a lot of horse stuff there without being a vet my roommate uh actually you know uh, was from the town she just wanted to live in the dorm so you know for breaks all the kids go you know I guess what I do now, biking or vaping or something, uh, we, we would go horseback riding <laughs> during breaks. So during lunch or any kind of break after school, we would go horseback riding. So it was pretty ideal uh, setting for me growing up and going to that point. The unideal part of it, of course, was what a lot of people don't know about. <laughs> the North wasn't that different from the South in a lot of ways and that I uh, integrated junior high school, all white junior high school. I integrated an all white high school. Cornell, there were like 75 African Americans in my in entering class of 3,000. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot of experience uh, being the first or the only or uh, breaking glass ceilings. So that was my growing up and uh, my vet story, how I got not to be a vet. But what happened with that was, which was fortuitous or actually uh, more beneficial, was that um, I, I wound up majoring in wildlife biology. <coughs> Who did not have any women, but they didn't say they didn't want any women. So it was a lot different atmosphere there. And hmm. so three women, three women graduated with degrees in wildlife biology. There. And so what did you do with it then when you got that degree? My first job was as a wildlife biologist, <laughs> believe it or not, with <laughs> the Bureau of Land Management. So that was, uh, I got to be the first woman in that agency. Were there a lot of challenges in getting that job or were you pretty well accepted right from the outset or what? Um, there's always going to be challenges. <laughs> yeah. To today even, but essentially, uh, and that was, I interviewed earlier today and um, it reminded me when you're, a senior in college, now you don't, you just go online and put in entries, but you would have to write, write letters. So people remember that you had to write letters to different agencies, companies asking to be considered. And I, uh, as a wildlife biologist, there are not a lot of options there. Uh, yeah. State government, maybe, and that's not likely because people die in place in the state government. So yeah. not the opening there. So what, it was. Uh, what year was it that you graduated? Um, I was graduating in 73. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah, so because was, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of um, things like, and, and it was much later than that. It was like 23 years later. Well, it was actually more than that. It was like 26 years. It was like 1999. Uh, my fourth guy, Doug Linney, became ill with glomeria nephritis. And the, the emergency vet, or actually the specialist that we took her to, was a woman. In, uh, in a veterinarian uh, facility that was mostly women. So clearly there was a lot of change. But anyway. Oh, there, yeah, well, it's, I would say it's all women now. <laughs> no, you made pretty hard. Put Very much a lot. Head. It is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, Timing is everything. <laughs> yeah, there's hardly there are very few men anymore. I don't, I'm not sure, sure exactly why, but there are very few men anymore in that field. Um, so I wrote my uh, letters to places that would hire wildlife people. So Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. Um, the Park Service and Forest Service both told me they didn't hire women, so that was pretty plain. And what's interesting now, and I talk to younger people, it's sort of horrified. People could say that then. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't uncommon. It wasn't thought to be different or rude or discriminatory or anything. They, uh, and so now, you know, I wish I kept the letters <laughs> yeah. You didn't keep the left. There wasn't anything different, right, than right. you seen before. Right. And uh, uh, Forest Service offered me a job as a secretary. They liked my degree from Cornell. Oh. <laughs> so they thought I would make a pretty good secretary. Yeah. So <laughs> the Bureau of Land Management is the only one that said, okay, 
And probably, uh, I say it's a perfect storm why I got that particular job. That job had been vacant for two years. They couldn't find anybody <laughs> to take it. So they figured, and, what the heck, we'll give her a try. Yeah, all right. Got to have somebody in here sooner or later. So I, I took that job, which was in Las Vegas, of all things, of all places. And it was it turned out great. It was an office, small office, 25 people or so in the office. The average age was 27 because nobody wanted to live in Vegas at that time. <laughs> so um, we had, a, if you can imagine, uh, people that age in Vegas, we had a great time. <laughs> we had a great time at that office, and, and it was a lot of fun. I was uh, one of six wildlife biologists in the state, because with the new Taylor thing now, people have seen all the movies and the shows and everything. But at that time, Wild Kingdom was it. That was yeah. the only show it mentioned, you know, that wildlife. Marlon policy. Perkins. Yep. So he was an inspiration to me and everybody who went into the field then at that time. Uh, but there weren't many of us. So I had 10 million acres to play with by myself. Um, so and, it was a lot of fun. And what was it you were to do with those 10 million acres? Uh, wildlife biology, it pretty much uh, studying, you know, patterns and uh, populations, uh, identifying endangered species, what we need to do to preserve them. What the big change for me was I went to school in upstate New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my first job was in the desert of Nevada. Yes. With completely different wildlife. <laughs> so I got to learn a lot about a lot of different wildlife. In fact, the main wildlife there was desert tortoises. and My favorite. Pup. Yeah, they're nice. And pupfish and mule deer. That's about it. <laughs> That's about it. <clears throat> well, I had desert tortoises as, as pets growing up, and then we lived in Mission Viejo in California in oh. 1982 through 1989. And um, my in-laws lived about 20, 25 miles away in San Clemente, and one day they were outside and a tortoise came walking up their driveway. Okay. <laughs> and they advertised because they wanted to find it. They figured it was a tortoise that belonged to someone, and nobody ever claimed it. And I said, I would love it. So um, we named him E.T. Turtle because his face was like E.T. And, right. uh, and he lived with us for, for a number of years. And then the gardener left the gate open, and he got out. But uh, it was fun. He loved cantaloupe. He loved rose petals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're interesting pets. Um, I had one one time that also got out. <laughs> and it's something you don't think about. You don't think about, you know, you think of dogs running away. <laughs> you don't think your tortoise is going to run away. But well, he they, wasn't they, running they away. He was just curious. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> it, it happens. Um, yeah. but, you know, what do you do? But by the same token, um, it was fun when he was around with us. And he... Um, figured out that we had a screen door in the backyard that went into the house and it wouldn't latch, but he figured okay. out he could use his front feet and open the door and come in. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and what he liked to do is go lie right in front of the refrigerator because the refrigerator was nice and warm. And, and um, that caused great consternation with our cat who couldn't figure out wow. what he was. So... That was. <laughs> That's good. Well, they're smarter than we think of. Oh, they uh, are. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are asking me today. Well, well, uh, or earlier interview. Well, we have a you know, master's degree in public administration, and I said, yeah, I have a people degree and an animal degree. Yeah. And believe me, the people degree is a lot harder. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Animals, wildlife would do fine on its own. Okay. <laughs> the reason why we have wildlife biologists is to uh, actually figure out what to do with, about the people. <laughs> Much more than the animals, you're right. Yep, exactly. So you became um, a wildlife biologist, and how long did you do that? I did that for a couple of years there in Vegas, and then what I figured out was that, um, well, being from New York, you know, very decisive, very aggressive, very sort of, is that Biologists don't make decisions. <laughs> they make recommendations. <laughs> Figured that out. It was like I can do a lot more for wildlife being in a more decision-making capacity. So I switched from wildlife biology to environmental science 
because the environmental scientists are the ones that wrote the environmental assessments mm -hmm. and, and the rules and the regs and all of that type of thing. And so I was able to do a lot more for wildlife from that position than I did from being a biologist. Was that and also from, in Las Vegas? Yeah, so I did that for two years. And then after that, I was on the road. I moved at that time, which is different now because I assume government can't afford it. They wanted you to move every three or four years, just like the military. So yeah. you did. <laughs> so that was four years, time to go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, because still the, the, some people think the good old days or the bad old days, depending on what side you're on, um, couldn't really get another job as a first <laughs> woman <laughs> in most of the Western areas there back east where I was hired. Um, uh, and, um, and that job was in Silver Spring, Maryland. So I hopped back, after that, I hopped back and forth across the country, just where the I don't know, best opportunities were. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've um, been in a number of positions where you were kind of the first or um, first woman yeah. to do it. What were, what were some of the others? Yeah, every job in the Bureau after that. Pretty much was a first, <laughs> was yeah. First. No, I was the first, um, the, um, so many, but I was um, a deputy for resources in New Mexico, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was uh, associate state director, that's the number two person in California. That was great. I was uh, the head person in the eastern region, which covered 31 states, uh, west that bordered on and east of the Mississippi. And then I was the uh, first and only woman um, person of color deputy director in the United States for the Bureau of Land Management in Washington, D.C. during the Clinton administration. So I was pretty okay. much in charge. Uh, it's a political position. The director is a political position. So the deputy is sort of <laughs> the one that sort of runs things as a, a, almost a COO type of position. Right. So in that, I had 10,000 employees and a billion-dollar budget and 200 offices. So that was very exciting. A little bit more expensive to live in D.C. than in Vegas. and But but I don't know. Today, Vegas is getting pretty expensive. Yeah, Vegas, and it's funny because Vegas even then was relatively expensive to other parts of the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I moved to D.C., um, you know, so long ago. And then I kept my house and, you know, move away and go move back. I was in D.C. a couple of times and luckily kept my house. <laughs> so it was that. The thing which the government, the other reason that government doesn't move you all over the place now is that they will buy your house. <laughs> and I'm sure they can't afford to do that type of thing anymore. Yeah, if you not did, as if you much. Did, yeah, if you didn't want to sell it or you couldn't sell it, the government would buy it and move you. Do you so, still have your house in D.C. now? No, yeah. If I kept it, I'd be a... <laughs> very well off right now yeah. but oh uh, yeah i left it so i moved to phoenix I, well it's interesting selling my house in dc i could afford two houses in phoenix i didn't buy two houses <laughs> probably should have done that too but i uh, um the, the, how low the price of the housing was here um, yeah and and now since past COVID, since everybody now has figured out it's a wonderful place to live um i think it had the highest rise in prices in the country Wow, this past year gets pretty hot in the summer. Now I live in Victorville, so we're on the high desert. We get over a hundred in the summer, but you get a lot yeah. more hot for longer periods of time than we do. We'll be in the high nineties, low hundreds or so, but Phoenix tends to get hotter. Yeah, well, it saves it as no humidity whatsoever. Right, <laughs> both cases where I am, pretty much the right. same thing. Yeah, so here the ideal temperature is probably a hundred. Yeah, 100 in summertime is fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll take it's, 100. <laughs> it's when it gets to 110, 115. It's a little bit uh, yeah. a little bit different. And we haven't been having much of that. So I guess climate change, we haven't been having as much of that lately. You um, did this summer, though, right? This past summer? This, this summer, yeah. But it was like one stretch. Yeah, <laughs> made right. national news. <laughs> they did make but, national news. You're right, but still. It, it, but it was just like. A week <laughs> or two, and I will trade that for eleven months of perfect weather <laughs> anytime. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> oh, so fun! But uh, yeah, Victorville, that was in my my area, you know. And I was uh, I had a, a California here, so 
um, high desert was pretty interesting. It's like two different countries. Uh, oh, it is. California. It is. Northern California and Southern California. <laughs> well, in Southern California, the high desert's different than the Inland Empire somewhat, and both different than yep. right on the coast. So exactly. so what do you do? It's, uh, it's it's the way it is. But it was 26 this morning when I oh. woke up. Yeah. Oh. Not not too bad. And it was <laughs> – high was 59. I was pretty impressed that it, it went up by 30, 30 degrees, so that's pretty cool. Oh. Well, cool yeah, we in were the having, neat sense of the word, yeah. And we were having a fit here <clears throat> because it was uh, the high was like fifty nine or sixty. People were ready to jump out windows here. <laughs> it was, it was. Uh, it, I don't know. And, and the thing is, here we complain about it being cold, but we don't have jackets. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't have coats. We don't have <laughs> anything that would make it not feel like that bad. Right. But, uh, right. Well, so. For a while, I lived in the Bay Area, and there were times up in Novato where we could get over 100, but typically it wasn't too bad, so we didn't have an air conditioner in the summer. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I lived in Sacramento. Which oh, that's hot. different. Yeah. Yeah, that was hot. That but was I would hot. tell people, you know, they come visit, and of course you have to take them to San Francisco if they're coming to visit you. They're really not coming to visit you. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. I know. <laughs> so you take them to San Francisco, and you always forewarn them, okay, San Francisco is going to be cool. <laughs> yeah. It's not the same, and still everybody's surprised, and they get to San Francisco and freeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like Mark Twain said, he said, I spend, a, what, a winter there, one week in the summer or something like that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah well, so how long did you stay with the Bureau of Land Management then? 29 years I was with them. And, oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. And I left, um, after I left the D.C. and the Clinton administration when I was uh, had the 200 offices. <laughs> and it, it, even the 200 offices didn't bother me as much as the issue is in D.C. I'm a very, like I said, sort of decisive kind of person. I like results. And D.C. is not designed for that. And, you know, it's not nobody's fault. It's just not designed to make decisions. So um, I wanted to go back where you could actually do things, uh, have projects that are finished, et cetera. So um, after a couple of years, I moved to Arizona, where I am now. So I've been here for 28 years. And um, it was great when I moved back here as the state director. And I wound up designating four national monuments, uh, helping get the Arizona Trail designated. I upgraded all the RV parks, um, a lot of the campgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I was able to do things, um, and I loved that. <laughs> and then what did you do? And so when I left, oh, I, they had an early out, which they don't do that anymore either. But <laughs> they used to say, okay, have they, like every so many years, they would say, okay, you can leave if you have, based on years, not your age. So guess what? Since I started two weeks out of college, <laughs> I had a lot of years and no age. So I got to retire super, super early in life. And what I did is Denise Merida Consultant Incorporated, which is a public and community relations firm, which actually wound up doing a lot of the same things, uh, tourism, recreation, um, and uh, uh, things for the outdoors. I helped also, well, things like uh, I helped uh, get the stadium built, the NFL stadium built here, um, well, several of the spring training stadiums, uh, designated, yeah, you know, just a lot of parks and star help get them designated, a lot of things like that. So I did, yeah, you know, pretty similar types of work, except uh, I'm from the private industry From the side. private end. So what made you leave BLM and start your own company? Um, just because of the, the, the out, the, out. Mm -hmm. the years, yep. yeah. Yeah, hard to pass that up, <laughs> that you could retire at that age. So yeah. I took that. And, and you know, it's, you can make up with it now. Uh, what I used to preach to people, they didn't believe me. Because people go, oh, government's so boring and blah, 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 blah. Well, it ceases to be boring when you have a pension and health care. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So. Uh, well, and you can make it as fun as you want. It all It's all yep. about mental attitude, too. Yeah. And I was blessed in working for the Bureau of Land Management because what you had is all scientists. 
right? It's all yeah. biologists, biologists, geologists. It's science people doing science. Happiest people in the world, you know? So I really enjoyed, um, I enjoyed them. They were enjoying their work. I enjoyed them. It was just, a, to me, a wonderful opportunity to work with people for that long who enjoyed their work. Um, and it's not too many people you can say that anymore. <laughs> but uh, it was unusual that why in government with our agency. Mm -hmm. So you, what, um, what made you start the company? You just wanted to continue doing the same sorts of things? And that was the easiest way to do yeah. it? or? Yeah, I probably should have stayed retired. No, <laughs> now I've enjoyed what I've done. But essentially, two weeks after retirement, the story was, well, two weeks after retirement, and I'm thinking, boy, gee, I can do anything now. This is, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. sort of a shock when you're working all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, like when I was in D.C., I was on the road 75% of the time. So anyway, um, in Arizona, I traveled a lot. But, oh, I could do anything. So a friend of mine called and said, well, why don't I? go to the movies. And it was like the middle of the day. And I thought, oh, my God, this is good. <laughs> we go to the movies. So we went to see a movie, very bad one, I won't mention. But I, and uh, I came back and water was coming out my front door. Uh oh, <laughs> I was burst, blah, blah, blah. I spent the next five weeks in a hotel. And so the only thing I can think is that I was um, <laughs> lost my mind. <laughs> because uh, it had happy hour every night. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, one night I invited somebody over to join, and join me in happy hour. And they go, oh, Denise, uh, what is great opening job opened up. And I think I had too much wine. <laughs> this great opening opened up, uh, heading up this nonprofit. You should take a look at that. And so um, I did. Uh, so my retirement didn't last very long. <laughs> so I ended up uh, that nonprofit. And I've been doing something ever since. <laughs> so what was that nonprofit? Um, it was the Arizona Trail <laughs> Association. <clears throat> you know, they were one of the longest trails in the United States. And it goes from border to border, from the northern border, Arizona, mm. to uh, Mexico. And spectacular trail because Arizona is beautiful. So, <laughs> so it's a very beautiful trail. But they were having problems getting it designated. Because of just politics, and I understand politics, so I helped them. Uh, actually, it was me and John McCain got together and helped get that trail designated. But um, I'm sort of a restless person, so I was only there for a, a year with them. I had my own Denise Vero Consultants started anyway. So then I just did a variety of things. I like projects, start, finish, start, finish, um, until about, you know, pretty much on my own until five years ago, I decided, well, why don't you get a whole group of people who like to do that? <laughs> and that's when World's Best Connectors was started. So the current organization that I manage and what it's you know, just made up of a bunch of folks like myself, they all have their own businesses, but we get together and people throw out ideas and we jump on them or not. Um, we're, we're a consulting firm. If and we're CEO to CEO. We're not B to B or C to B. All those things. We're CEO to CEO. So what we do is help other executives with problems. <laughs> um, they come in. They need a tech person. They need a HR person. They need whatever. Uh, come to us. We either have a person like that, or we can get them a person like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done in the past five years. Is Disease Meredith Consultant still functioning, yep. or? So, yes. you, so you have two companies. Yeah. Uh, well, actually three, but we won't even go there. <laughs> it gets too complicated. But you no, know, I have a nonprofit to read to kids U.S. I'm trying to get parents to read to their kids again, uh -huh. like they did in the old days. But the uh, Denise Ferret Consultants, where that comes in, is um, and a lot, really the reason that I met you, uh, really, at uh, do a lot of uh, conferencing and whatever. But I do coaching, professional coaching for um, people, and particularly for baby boomers and Gen X, what I do is help them rediscover their mojo, is what I call it. <laughs> and so I think both of those groups pretty much had it made in the beginning of 2020. Um, you know, they had figured it out. <laughs> they were doing well, the economy is doing well, it's all kinds of opportunities going, everything looks fantastic. I, as an example, was at 
in Miami for Super Bowl week with my group, a group from World's Best Connectors. And we were networking, going to a lot of special events, thinking of future partnerships, future contracts. And two weeks later, we come back, COVID closed everything down. Mm. So, so um, and that happened to a lot of, um, well, it happened to everybody, but baby, I think baby boomers and Gen Xers took it because it was more of a disappointment. <laughs> you thought you had it figured out. You thought you had everything made. And then when the uh, president says uh, COVID's done, pandemic's over, uh, those people ran back to work. And guess what? They were the only ones who came back. <laughs> Nobody else was in the office. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else wanted to be in the office. And a bunch of them got COVID. Yeah. So it was just... Uh, to me, devastating for a lot of people in uh, my age group. <laughs> so what I do is, uh, you know, work with them. You can't go backwards. It's not going to change. <laughs> it's not going to go back to what it was. What can we do to find your happiness again? A place and a position and a, a life that can make you happy again. Yeah. A lot of people don't notice uh, that really COVID gave them a second chance. Yes. Okay, give them another opportunity. Maybe they didn't even like that job. <laughs> that now, you know, that they're complaining about the job anyway. <laughs> so what can we do to get you something that you do like or no job at all? That's the other thing. People have a hard time transitioning sometimes to retirement. And so I help people over those humps. That's what I try to help people. Do. So you do a lot of coaching and, and yep. helping people and, and so on. I should explain to the folks listening out there that Denise and I met through Potapalooza, that people know what Potapalooza is. We've talked about it a number of times on on Unstoppable Mindset. And for those who don't know, Potapalooza is a program that meets four times a year. And the people who come are either podcasters, interested in being podcasters, or want to be interviewed by podcasters. Pretty much those are the, the people that usually come. And uh, Denise and I met there. And uh, here we are. Yeah, we had a, you know, I think a lot in common as far as the way we look at the world and the yeah. way we look at uh, achieving things and being happy. <laughs> so, I uh, yeah, I was very impressed with uh, what you do, what you've overcome. I do a lot of uh, speeches. Well, now it's coming up on Black History Month, so mm -hmm. people for that. Oh, Women's History Month, back to back. But I get requests, obviously. Um, because people want to know how, yeah, obviously all these, all these things could have been <clears> obstacles, <throat> not being a vet, <laughs> the not, you know, getting certain jobs, the not getting promotions, all of that. You can look at that as an obstacle that it is, or you can figure out a way to overcome that. And but you, but you made a choice somewhere in your psyche that you weren't going to let those kinds of things stop you and that you were going exactly. to continue to move on. Exactly. And that's, that's the only way to, to do it. Um, things are not going to be equal, you know, and that's one thing that's sort of hard to take, but it's true. Uh, baby boomer. Well, what we see is what we see. <laughs> what we see is what we get. Yeah. Um, so I, if you think about it, I was a kid when uh, civil rights act was passed and Everybody thought everything was going to change, okay? yeah. and it it hasn't, and it didn't. Something's changed, <laughs> but uh, women can be vets now. You know, overall, there are still a lot of obstacles. So I work with people. Well, I not work with people. I hope to be a role model for people in how not to give up. Um, and uh, and I say essentially, one door closes, God opens another one for mm -hmm. you. you. Have to take it. <laughs> What's up? What's ironic is, uh, so the same thing in a sense with the Americans with Disabilities Act, everybody thought everything was going to change, and it hasn't. Unemployment rates have dropped a little bit, but they're mm -hmm. still incredibly high. Internet websites aren't accessible uh, yep. for the most part. And we're not included in a lot of the conversations. When you talk about diversity, that doesn't generally include disabilities. So some of us, like, uh, like I, and I've talked about it on the podcast here, talk about inclusion. Uh, you either are inclusive or you're not. There's no middle ground. You either are going to be or you're not. But at the same time, the the thing that we have and continue to face is not included in a lot of the conversations 
Um, so I don't hear anybody talking about a disability history awareness month or anything like that, although there is a month dealing with disabilities, but it is not nearly as well discussed and, and mentioned and, and talked about or included as other minorities, even though we're a larger minority than all of them. Well, and everybody has the potential to be in that group. And everybody has the potential to be in that group. <laughs> everybody well, actually, get it, right? <laughs> well, of course, actually, in in a technical sense, everybody is a member of that group. I, I believe that we've misinterpreted the definition of disability and that disability okay. is a characteristic that everyone has. It manifests in different ways. Like you can see in your disability, or at least one of your disabilities, is your light dependent. You know, if the power goes out, what are you going to do? You got to go off and try <laughs> right. to find a, 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 a light source. Thomas Edison fixed it mostly, but not totally. And so mm -hmm. it, it still creeps in. So the bottom line is everybody has a disability. Um, sure. You know, it's something that we, we, we really should think more about. But there's a lot of fear, and people know that they could become a person with a physical disability or whatever. And so the fear keeps us from being really included like we ought to be. And I've always had a, a, um, empathy uh, along those lines, whatever reason, my parents, whatever reason was. But I, um, when I became the director, uh, the deputy director of the Bureau, uh, ADA had just you know, mm -hmm. pretty much been passed, all right? And so I hired a person to, you know, interpret that <laughs> legislation for us and help people with that legislation. Boy, did that set off a firestorm. How can you be wasting a position on that? And nobody cares about that, and nobody needs to know that. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so, yeah. but you know, I do what I do, right? <laughs> so so I went ahead, and in this case, she was a herring and impaired but um as soon as she got there it, things changed people oh i have a question oh i don't understand this oh how can i do this better and of course today <laughs> and of course today most people rightfully so would not be caught dead saying hearing impaired because people who are right. deaf or hard of hearing recognize impaired is is a negative thing we're not impaired okay. you know right. the the and and that hasn't really translated into blindness because so many no. people continue to say visually impaired, and it should okay. be blind or low vision because why That's are we? Good. Why do you equate how much sight you have with whether you're impaired or not? And mm -hmm. and that's the issue. Or why do you oh, equate yeah. whether you how much you hear as to whether you're impaired or not? That's sure. the the whole thing we have to to oh, change, yeah. and it and it's just so hard to do because it's so ingrained in society. Yeah, um, LBGQTIA plus, <laughs> as an example, you know, there's it, it, just um, the getting across what we need to get across. And it's getting harder, not easier to <laughs> talk to people about anything, right? Yeah. Um, it, unfortunately, it's getting harder. So, uh, but anyway, she went on to uh, be pretty popular, <laughs> pretty pretty much in demand. But I, um, I'm doing right now one of the projects that we're working on in World's Best Connectors is business education for college athletes. So again, it sort of comes up. Most people, when they think about the NCAA's ruling on name, image, and likeness, NIL, that kids could get paid for playing, um, they think of football. <laughs> Men, yeah. and foot Men and football, that's the whole thing. And if you look at the statistic, that's where the money is, that's where the NIL money is going, blah, blah, blah. To men in football and so my group <laughs> we're looking at students overall and our program is open to any student in any sport in any school and i want people that want to go to the olympics i want paralympic people i want lbgqt people <laughs> i want any athlete uh, but again that's different people aren't saying that they're not thinking that at all mm -mm. right um so we're going to be a little different that way, but I always have been different. But I think, if anything, those other groups all need it more because right now, 2% of NCAA athletes in college become professional athletes, 2%. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking at the 98%. <laughs> what are they going to do afterwards? And, you know, college is not really prepared for them for that. It's, no. You know, colleges, they have different goals, <laughs> okay? And uh, I don't begrudge them that. They have different goals and different objectives. But what we're doing is teaching them how to 
create a business, run a business. Uh, so they have something when they leave college. They leave our program with a business license. So they have something when they leave college. What they do with it after that will uh, be up to them. But at least it gives them a chance and opportunity um, to be, I say, something besides a picture in a yearbook. Yeah. Which is something that certainly makes sense to do. Yeah. So we're, uh, it's called Project Nilo. And so I encourage uh, people to look into it. It's pretty simple. It's www.projectnilo.com. <laughs> pretty simple. But the uh, O is for uh, ownership. And what we do is want to put ownership into NIL on the side <laughs> of the kid. So it's, it's just something different. But it's so, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, but uh, you know, the things why I like liked you when I met you, and why I like your program is there's such a need for educating the public about things, and it's getting harder and harder to do that. But people, you know, to me, that's <laughs> the uh, um, uh, anti-intellectual approach that's being taken to so many things. Mm-hmm. Um. It makes it more difficult. So I appreciate what you're doing. You us. have you have in your life, I'm sure, had, um, well, you talk a lot about mentoring, and you've been a mentor to a number of people. Who are some of the people who have been your mentors? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, I didn't have many women. <laughs> I didn't have any women mentors in the Bureau. I was it. So I became the permanent woman mentor in the Bureau of Land Management. But I did have a lot of male mentors, and that's one thing I try to get across to people. Don't, not to make stereotypes of people, judgments about people, you never know. My first mentor in Bureau of Land Management was an older Anglo guy. And I say older, we thought he was really old because he was 55. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's like 20, right? <laughs> Just 22, 21, whatever. So, um, and he was a, 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 a sagebrush specialist, right? <laughs> that was his sign. Um, so you wouldn't think, uh, and he was a uh, Republican, conservative, you could go down the line. And we hit it off perfectly, which you wouldn't think. So you can't make judgments about people. And he really helped me in the beginning because, like I said, I dealt with wildlife in New York. <laughs> and we were in Nevada. So he taught me a lot of desert survival skills that I needed to have and um, really helped me understand the Bureau and it's what it did and how it did it, stuff like that. So Jim Bruner was uh, my first mentor there. But then I had others along the way. Uh, Ed Hasty was the director of California for like 30 years. <laughs> he was the Bureau director in California. He was uh, also a godsend. Uh, he would say, I like women better. They work harder. <laughs> and he was, he was a big guy, Marine veteran, you know, tough guy, and buzz cut until he died, you know. <laughs> and uh, so to have someone like that accept you <laughs> yeah, and, you know, promote you, uh, uh, it's like having a, your own pet, uh, pit bull, right? <laughs> but it was very helpful. So I've had uh, people like that, G uh, John McCain, Arizona. So I had uh, mainly just because of the nature of the work I was in, mainly male mentors, mainly Anglo male mentors. So um, I just tell people to keep an open mind about things. Uh, and you can learn from everyone. And I've had great support. Was your mom a mentor to you? Yeah. Yeah. I talk about that to your parents, if you're lucky, <laughs> right? yeah. It'd be the first mentor. So I, I described my dad and everything that he did. And my mom was community organizer, a very strong, uh, liberated woman, <laughs> so, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so from both of them, I got a little bit from both of them that helped uh, shape me. To where, and they, uh, and really, they're the ones who said you could do anything. Yeah. Obviously, you could. <laughs> but they didn't say that, you know. They were very supportive. The track, the uh, track to get to Cornell is no easy track, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> in New York. It starts, my mother had figured it out. It pretty much started when I graduated from elementary school. So I was valedictorian there. And she knew 
You had to get into the right junior high school to get into the right high school to get to Cornell. Hmm. <laughs> okay. She was that far ahead of us, I'm thinking. So that's why I integrated <laughs> the junior high school. And uh, it was all white. I think there was 20 <laughs> people of color in that whole school. And then I integrated the uh, high school that I went to as well. And, you know, that was no easy thing, but I keep your eye on the prize and what you want out of it, what you got. And then that high school was sort of a feeder type of high school for Cornell. Here's a, an off-the-wall question. Going back to mentors for a second, you mentioned John McCain. How about Cindy McCain? Cindy is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and people, I don't know, maybe most people outside of Arizona don't realize, or the Southwest, um, it, was a, it was a couple. <laughs> yeah. She was, she was very important in his decision-making. Uh and uh, his, uh, just being, and I, I, you know, I loved them both. Uh, they were such a strong couple. Um, and uh, she's carried on. She does a she lot. She has. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, you know, he was the, the visible one mm -hmm. pretty much in the news and all that. But she is clearly continued to move, move forward and is a, a vibrant force in her own right, which is great. Yeah, and she, because uh, I'm going to approach her about uh, my program, too. But, um, they, you know, it's, um, yeah, he, yeah, in politics in general, you know, we just don't have many like him. And mm -hmm. now, you're a Republican or Democrat. I, I've been independent all my life, so it hasn't mattered, obviously. <laughs> but, but the, um, just, we need people to have conviction, <laughs> you know, and, make honest decisions, uh, not based on, you know, contributions or anything like that. Yeah, and right. that's really the issue is having true convictions. And we just don't see that much of it in the world in general, like we should. No. And, uh, you know, who knows when we'll get there again either. But it's very uh, um, prize people. People never really knew what he was going to vote, you know, how he's going to vote, even though he was a conservative Republican. So you could guess some of it. But... Uh, he did a lot of environmental work. This, you know, yeah. I know because I was working with him on it, right? <laughs> so that would shock people. <laughs> you know, they would not think that would happen. There, but. there were a few decisions he made I thought were a little bit strange, but, um, yeah. you know, but that's okay. You you do yeah. what you can. But clearly he was a, a man of convictions and um, mm -hmm. and was was one of the good ones. Yeah, he was also effective. <laughs> that's one thing. There yeah. you go. You know, well, I don't know if we have too many effective politicians <laughs> anymore, but he brought a lot of money to the state. He uh, was very obviously supportive of the military. Um, so veterans, he did a lot to help veterans. He did a lot of, yeah, to me, uh, very <clears throat> important things that involved getting money. You have to get money to do good things. And he did, uh, had a, you know, did a good job of doing that. But, uh, you know, so a lot of politicians now, you don't see them getting money for anyone but <laughs> to themselves in a lot of cases. So yeah. um, it's pretty sad. But. Yeah, we don't have the role models that, that we used to have, the true Not role a, models that you can look up to in terms of ethics and everything else. Yeah, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, another person we lost, mm -hmm. her, was another uh, wonderful person. Um, I met her, obviously, through my stuff with the Bureau of Land Management. But um, again, um, you know, people can predict. Yeah, you know, she voted accordingly. <laughs> you could not predict or assume, you know, that she was going to do this and do that. She evaluated every issue that came up and, and uh, you know, stuck to her guns with it. She was very important. She also, what I liked about her um, is that she really promoted education. Right now, Arizona, I don't know, I didn't look this past year. Well, they have pretty much been number 49 out of 50 states <laughs> in education. And she was, did a lot to try to rectify that by really pushing um, education. She thought that people, and she was right, don't know enough about government. Yeah. Uh, it's not taught anymore. <laughs> people don't know how government works, how, what is public service, how that is. I know... Uh, Bureau and other federal agencies have a hard time getting anyone anymore. And believe me, we need 
civil servants. <laughs> we need public servants so who are you know honest and there just to do a good job. We need to get leaders, and and it isn't just civil servants. Yep. They they need to to understand, and and out of civil servants, we need to to grow leaders too. Right, and uh, and it's really a lot of people have been discouraged. Like even a science, even a science, <coughs> they can't do science anymore, right? So, so the scientists are not happy campers as they used to be. Yeah, it's gotten um, very politicized. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know, but uh, I my what I've decided from here on have a few years left, maybe <laughs> just a few. But anyway, is to um, as a legacy. My legacy, hopefully, would be. Developing future leaders. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing with this education program. We're going to create a whole new generation of business leaders, which will be nice. People that in the past, their qualities have been overlooked. Athletes, people don't think about them except how fast they can run or how high yeah. they can jump. Yeah. And when you think about it, uh, the discipline there that they had to go through to be to where they are. Um, charismatic. A lot of them are charismatic <laughs> leader type people. Um and, you know, we're missing all of that by just, you know, throwing them out if they can't run down the field anymore. Yeah. So I'm hoping to give them some alternatives that in turn, they can take that business degree, go back home, hire people in their area, in their community, go back home with a business degree and have a family business. Mm hmm. You know, it's it's multiple. Yeah, you know, the the effects will multiply dramatically. I hope <laughs> from what they were doing with this program. You mentioned earlier, read to kids. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's uh, it's my fun project. But I feel one. I've been writing since I was ten years. Well, probably before, but since I, I wrote my first book when I was ten years old, I remember <gasps> writing it too. I was a pretty good artist. <laughs> but um, I'm concerned that. People aren't, I think reading is the crux of a lot of things. Uh, um, Decision-making, uh, you know, rationality, everything. But my angle on it is, in the past, parents read to their kids. It was one moment, you know, bedtime stories. Yeah. <laughs> one moment, bedtime, alone, with your child, quietly do something together. Now it's pretty much, and I'm a Comic Con fan, so I'm not knocking Marvel in particular. But now it's you know, sit the kid on front of the TV, and watch Marvel until it's time to go see. Um, parents are very busy. Um, they got a lot of different jobs. Uh, it's just to me that's something that's been lost. And when I uh, read the Kids US, the the mascot is my dog, <laughs> my miniature poodle, Ari. And he has five books on Amazon. <laughs> and the adventures of Ari are about what he's doing as he grows up, so to speak. So Ari writes first... Ari writes his own books? Yeah, he does a good job. Cool. <laughs> his books sell more than mine. <laughs> but he has uh so his first haircut or first time he went to the doctor or those types of issues. So he helps kids overcome those you know, fears that they might have. But to me the key is um they're and what I my our model is to read to a kid three to six years old, fifteen minutes a day. So you take that fifteen minutes, read in fifteen minutes. So we have all the authors in our group. You can read those books, fifteen minutes, and that's just fifteen minutes, which doesn't seem long, but it's you know <laughs> face to face, <laughs> uh, total attention, working on something together, and it just doesn't happen much anymore. No. But what I've seen when we would go to book shows or whatever and type of thing. And so all the people that go to these giant, you know, now they still have a few, I was glad to find out, a few giant book um, fairs going on. One in Tucson, I guess 100,000 people go to that one. It's pretty incredible. But everybody that will come up to our booth say, oh, yeah, my mom used to read to me. It's passed along. Yeah. <laughs> passed along. And these people that are coming up to you are very educated, <laughs> erudite people, right? Um, so that's what I hope to do. And luckily, um, I had a uh, Art O'Hagan, and I'll give a shout out to him. 
he, uh, during pandemic, he bought Ari's books and distributed them to nurses and hospitals so that they could go home and read to their kids. Hmm. And so you get the nice letters. Oh, it's the first time my kid read out loud. <laughs> or it's the first time they discussed. I hoped in these books that people would get some lessons from them um, that the kid might talk about. Oh, you didn't know that your kid was afraid of such and such. <laughs> yeah. You know, or you didn't know the kid was being bullied at school. Or you didn't know these things. It, uh, you know, so it can open up a lot of discussions. So it's uh, readtokids.us <laughs> is uh, that site. And it, it's just a little thing I do on the side. Um, but I'm hoping it has some impact um, on parents, grandparents in particular. I thought grandparents were really sort of left out during COVID. You know, they couldn't even see anybody <laughs> um, and got separated from the grandkids. Um, my books are... Mary's books, obviously, you can get them on Kindle, you can get them on online. And so it's something that you can do now with technology. You can do over uh, what we're doing, Zoom. Right. <laughs> you can read to your grandkid on the other side of the country <laughs> through Zoom. So all right, that's what I'm hoping. Uh, well, I, know I appreciate you asking about it. It's sort of a little thing I do on the side, but um, Read to Kids US, it's uh, has my heart. It's something that I really... I uh, like to see happen. So how does the program work? What do you do? Um, what we do is just write books. Uh, they're online. And what we had pre-COVID, <laughs> or we'll have after starting again this year, is go to schools. You know, go to schools, go to libraries. You know, Ari goes. <laughs> I take Ari. <laughs> and he goes. And we have, uh, you know, the books there and parents, you know, buy the books. We read. We have readings. Where the authors from our, you know, our, our group come and they read to some of the kids there and whatever. So it's just getting kids excited about reading again. Hmm. And uh, parents like it too. <laughs> parents like it too. That is so. that is really cool. What books have you written? Um, I I just have two of my own. <laughs> but anyway, Ari has five. <laughs> but I have. Uh, he's got four for paws though, so he's got four to write <laughs> That's with. That's true. That's true. Uh, Thoughts While Chillin', and it's C-H-I-L-L-I-N with no G, is uh, really covers my career from <laughs> being born in Brooklyn, I guess, up into uh, uh, my career through the Bureau of Land Management. So um, it's funny when you write something like that, and you call it an autobiography, because when you're young, you don't think you're going to live that long. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was like, Gee, well, I guess I had some more living to do. I should write something else. <laughs> so the other book is a sequel to that, and it's called uh, The Year a Roof Rat Ate My Dishwasher, which people go, huh, say what? Okay. Yeah. Uh, roof, <laughs> roof rats are, I don't know, that they're, I guess they're native to Arizona. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we have roof rats here. Other people have different kinds of pests in their areas, but we have roof rats. And mm. they eat, they, they have big teeth. <laughs> They're not like normal rats. <laughs> they have big teeth. They climb trees and they eat through pipes. They eat through all kinds of things. So literally, I, I, and the, the story opens in that book. The first story is about the my dishwasher stopped working. And I had the, the, the guy come to repair it and he opened stuff up and he like jumps back and screams. I go, whoa, what happened? And he goes, look at the pipe. So the rats had eaten through the PCV pipe. <laughs> mm. And that's why my dishwasher was not working. And so what I wanted to do with this book is uh, it's very much about Arizona. So it's an Arizona survival guide is what I call it. <laughs> Arizona is a very particular place with very un unique problems like roof rats. And um, so I talk about as a business person, how to survive here in Arizona, what kinds of things to uh, <laughs> consider and look out for. And I try to tell people it's a great place to live. Though people know that already. But there are some things that are different here that you have to look out for. Oh. Uh, scorpions, roof rats, <laughs> rattlesnakes. Black widows. Uh, yeah, uh, 115 degree temperatures now and then. Um, but uh, I try to keep it very upbeat. And I also try to acknowledge people here in Arizona that are doing very positive things. I uh, like McCain, I mentioned in there. Uh, people who... Uh, because Arizona doesn't get any recognition, <laughs> really. It has a very strange reputation uh, outside of Arizona. 
And um, I wanted to get across that it is a very normal place. <laughs> uh, with, it's a, a purple state. <laughs> so we don't get much into that. But it's um, we have people all kinds and all uh, religions and all uh, people think there aren't people of color here for some reason because it, it sort of looks that way if you walk through parts of Scottsdale. But yeah. it's uh, going to be a um, majority minority state in a couple of years. So um, there are plenty of people of color here, uh, <laughs> and it's uh, just a wonderful place to live. So uh, my second book, while it's, out, it's about me and people I know here and what they've accomplished, it's also I, um, my uh, love you book to Arizona. <laughs> so do you see desert tortoises these days? Uh, here in Phoenix, not anymore, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's so built up. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, Phoenix is also spread out. Believe it or not, it's the biggest city now geographically in the country. Uh, it surpassed L.A. <laughs> so now it's the biggest. Yeah. And so around the edges, people live around the edges. So uh, they see tortoises, but they also see coyotes and oh, yeah. cats. Yeah. <laughs> rattlesnakes <laughs> so i you know i had my years as a wildlife biologist i don't need that anymore <laughs> yeah. well if people want to reach out and contact you how do they do that okay um pretty simple um uh, uh you can get my website that's about me is denise meredith.com can, can you spell that please yeah i was about to do that thank cool, you great because people spell it incorrectly <laughs> so it's d-e-n-i-s-e M E R I D I T H dot com. Meredith is normally spelt with two E's, so I don't get much junk mail. <laughs> but it's DeniseMeredith.com is my website, and you can sort of go from there. It links you to other things. World's Best Connectors is the WBCs.com. Again, in my Comic Con routine, but uh, we're the, the, the WBCs. That's what we <laughs> pretend to be. But it's T H E W B C S dot com. Uh, that's the other site they can go to. And I really uh, welcome people to join in. Uh, read to kids.us if you want to see Ari <laughs> and hear about Ari and get some kids' books. But I really want to encourage people to read to their children and read to their grandchildren. It's, it's like a lost art, Michael. <laughs> it's getting to be a lost art. And if people but, go to our, our show notes and so on, um, you have some gifts that you're giving away. Yes. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, it's called the, uh, and when we talk about mentors, right? So it's called a mentor's almanac, <clears throat> uh, one of the gifts I'm giving away, in which you can, uh, and what it is, is 365 tips on how to be a great leader. And so I have a sort of a mantra every day that you can use, um, that you can use in uh, helping you mentor other people. And also, hopefully, help yourself at the same time. And then people can call me, and when they go to my site, they can get the phone number there, too, um, and set up a call with me about coaching. Again, I have masterminds. I'm starting a mastermind here probably the end of the month, so call me about that. And um, I also do personal coaching, private coaching. And while I emphasize uh, Gen X and baby boomers, I, you know, really an executive coach for anyone. It's just those groups are pretty uh, in need right now of that. I get it, kids, through my uh, events, like at World's Best Connectors, uh, through my events with the educational program. So I'm going to be helping kids. I'm not discriminating against <laughs> younger people. I'm going to be helping them. But I, uh, I coach um, baby boomers and Gen X primarily. Cool. Well, again, I want to thank you for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Can you believe it? We've been doing it over an hour now, which is oh, that's uh, amazing. Well, I is appreciate cool. it. It's, it's well, I, when I once I met you, I know hey, this is going to be great. <laughs> I think we're going to stay in touch and do a lot of good things. Well, tonight. I sincerely hope so, and definitely want to do that. So I want to thank you again, and thanks for listening wherever you are. We really appreciate it, whether you're listening or watching on YouTube or some other podcast source. Uh, would really appreciate it if you give us a five-star rating. We value your ratings very highly. And, of course, needless to say, love five-star ratings. So please do that. Um, love your opinions. Any thoughts that you have about um, what we did today? And we appreciate your opinions. If you know of anyone who 
ought to be a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, Denise, you as well. Uh, please let us know. We're always looking for additional guests, people who we can have on to tell their stories and talk about what they'd like to talk about. If you wish to reach out to me, you can do so by emailing me at Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. You can also go to our podcast webpage, www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. And Michael Hinkson is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N. So www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. And again, love those ratings. Really appreciate it. Um, and we definitely want to hear from you and get your thoughts. So one last time, Denise, I want to thank you for being here and taking so much time to, to be with us. Oh, thank you, Michael. And I wish you continued success.